Good afternoon. And welcome to the verge of spring break in Mississippi, where it is supposed to snow tonight. I'm not making that up. This is a true story. Um, we're going to send you off, though, into your downtime with plenty to think about with today's South Talk. As always, we thank Afton Thomas, Associate Director for Programs, for her leadership in assembling the South Talk series. And we thank Rebecca Cleary for getting the word out to you, the audience, that these events are happening. My name is Katie McKee, and I have the great privilege of serving currently as the director of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. We want to tell you first, just as a reminder, that our next South Talks will be the week following spring break, and you can see information about those on the screen right now. At four o'clock on March the 24th, we will hear about the Memphis Summer Avenue Oral History Project. And on March 25th at noon, we will hear from photographer Sam Wong, whose work is now on exhibit in the Center's Gamel Gallery. One of the true silver linings of the pandemic is realizing not just what it has prohibited, although we've thought about that a lot, but also what it has made possible. One of those things, despite our sometimes exhaustion with it, is the magic of the Zoom screen that lets us today connect Mississippi and Maryland to hear about the collaborative research of these two scholars. Although we have resumed some in-person programming, including the Oxford Conference for the Book, March 30th through April the 1st, the center plans to continue building some virtual programming into our calendar annually. It allows us to connect to audiences in other places and to connect points of scholarship as we are today that might otherwise be delayed while we worked out travel plans. So Matt, we hope you'll come to see us one day in Oxford, but we're glad you could be here virtually today. Our programming theme this year at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture is Mississippi Voices. Some of them have been musical, some historical, some literary, some artistic. Today's South Talk pays attention to voices quite literally, what they say, in what language, in what place. Stephen Fafulas is Associate Professor of Spanish and Linguistics at the University of Mississippi and Director of the Socioling Lab, which trains students to participate in community-engaged scholarship and to study linguistics at home and abroad. He's the editor of Amazonian Spanish, Language Contact and Evolution, and the author of more than a dozen articles. In addition, he recently delivered a very popular TEDx talk called Mexississippi, Preparing for the Future of Spanish in the South. Stephen is one of the founders of the SEC Spanish, Spanish Consortium, which is planning its inaugural conference for the spring of 2023. And he has recently been awarded a Fulbright to conduct research in Spain. Matt Van Hoos is executive, executive director of academic engagement at Howard Community College in Columbia, Maryland, where he also teaches a variety of classes. He has a PhD in sociocultural anthropology and served for a time as the associate director of Indiana University Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, later working for the National Humanities Alliance. His research has concentrated on music in Uruguay. Today, they are here to tell us about their partnership and how what they're learning shapes our understanding of the U.S. South. Thanks for being here. Take it away. Well, thanks so much, Professor McKee, uh, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and, and thanks to everyone uh, at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture for uh, the invitation to be here today. Special thanks to Afton Thomas uh, for all her work to get us ready and to make this possible. Uh, and, and most importantly, thanks and welcome uh, to all of you who have chosen to, to be with us uh, on this Friday afternoon when you could have been elsewhere preparing for the great snowstorm. Uh, so gracias y bienvenidas y bienvenidos. Uh, I'm going to start us off by sharing my screen, of course. Okay. And, and kind of to, to build on, on what Katie was just saying, you know, um, I want to kind of share that the, the South Talk's focus on voices for this year uh, really resonated uh, for Stephen and me as um, people with a kind of abiding interest in language and speech and how they form part of social life. So we wanted to pick up on that theme explicitly uh, with our title, Voces Sureñas, which we would translate as Southern Voices. And as kind of an initial entree uh, into the work that we're going to be presenting today, we wanted to really emphasize the, 
the plurality or the multiplicity in that formulation, the voices instead of voice. Um, you know, the, the multiplicity of the voices of the lived experiences and also of the ways of speaking uh, that comprise Spanish speaking communities in the two areas of the US South um, where our work is focused. So let's start by just kind of setting the stage here at the broad national level, where one of the things that we can note uh, is that the US is in fact home to one of the largest Spanish speaking populations in the entire world. Uh, and, and I think that general observation is in little dispute, although I think also immediately we need to acknowledge um, some caveats, one of which is the concern over undercounting of minoritized populations by the US census. We're not gonna delve into that, but we need to acknowledge it uh, because that 56 million number that you're seeing there in this um, chart uh, comes from that census question uh, about whether a language other than English is spoken in the home, and if so, which one. Um, so, so it's important to acknowledge that. But what's, I think, even more immediately interesting to us is 6% um, of this 56 million figure, so close to 3 million people, who report speaking Spanish at home did not simultaneously claim Hispanic or Latino ethnic identity um, in that same section or in, the diff in a different section of the census. And then perhaps as notably or even more, close to 30% of those who did claim Hispanic or Latino ethnic identity reported that they did not speak Spanish at home. Um, so again, with all the caveats that we might want to recognize about the US census as a way of understanding um, this population, um, what we're seeing here is clearly that there is a strong relationship uh, between Spanish use and Hispanic, Latino, Latinx identity, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And it's important to keep that in mind. It's complex in ways that remind us that this community is not by any means a monolith, you know, including for the purposes that we're gonna be considering here with you today, which are really kind of considering the place that Spanish holds in the life of these communities. So here again, voces instead of la voz. Um, so let's kind of dial this in regionally now where we certainly can note uh, that the U.S. did experience greater growth in its Hispanic Latino population over the last decade than any other U.S. region. But here again, you can see this is a much more granular analysis of the same phenomenon. We need to recognize that this growth was not equally distributed throughout that entire large census region that, that is called the South for these purposes. Rather, it was concentrated in what have been termed new destination communities. And these tend to be smaller, non-urban areas where there hasn't historically been as large of a Spanish-speaking or Hispanic Latino population. So in other words, not Houston, not Miami, but rather places that look a lot more like the two areas that we're highlighting in our project, um, Northern Mississippi and Eastern North Carolina. So there are a number of really interesting questions then kind of emerging from this new trend that we're seeing with new destination communities, how patterns of language use are gonna shift in response to these trends and how, if at all, the Spanish that people continue to speak will show the effects of its contact with English as these communities come into contact with, another, with one another. It's worth noting that the, the question in the other direction is equally interesting to pose, i.e. the effect on people's English. Um, that's just not what we're focused on for this project. So there's one final dimension of this kind of plurality that we're mentioning, both says, um, to, to kind of frame the work. Uh, that we want to note here in the outset, and that's just the vast social, cultural, linguistic, dialectal diversity of the Spanish-speaking world. And if you'll forgive me, I've permitted myself just a small detour to share an image, uh, really kind of an imagining of the South American continent by a painter, Joaquin Torres Garcia, who's from Uruguay, where I've done a lot of work. Um, and incidentally, and not you know unimportantly for our purposes, Uruguay is sometimes referred to as el sur del sur, the south of the south. Um, and, and so, you know, what I think this points out is that, you know, from a Latin American perspective, there are in fact multiple souths, uh, another of which is southern Mexico. Um, and, you know, which is important to recognize differs greatly from the northern states of that country. Um, and then, you know, when we even start to talk about borders, uh, it's important to think in the context of the work that we're going to present today, not only about the northern border of Mexico, but about the southern border of Mexico. Um, and that's because really since midway through the 20 teens, the countries of Central America's northern triangle, so um, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, um, actually surpassed Mexico 
as the primary immigrant sending countries um, from Latin America into the United States. So all of this background um, is, um, we hope, helpful for kind of explaining, you know, how the close study of language that we're conducting can help us to kind of track several social, cultural, and linguistic processes at once. And this is the important part, from the vantage point of the people who are protagonizing and experience that change. And so, you know, through the work that we're conducting, what we hope to do is gain a better understanding of what people's lived experiences are and have been in these communities of the U.S. South and what those experiences in turn imply for the future of Spanish uh, in this region. Uh, so with that, uh, that's kind of an initial setup. I'm going to turn it over to Stephen. Thank you so much, Matt. I also want to just reiterate the thanks to Afton and to Katie for making this possible, to everybody in attendance today, and to Matt um, for all of his collaboration and for his great introduction to our study. So I forgot to thank you, Stephen. I, I was incredibly remiss in not doing so. Gracias, amigo. Amigo mío, de la vida, de la vida, es cierto. Okay, so uh, hopefully I've successfully shared my screen and everybody can hear me okay. Uh, wonderful. So let's take a closer look at the areas under observation in our study. First, as regards to Northern Mississippi, we do note that there has been this steady increase over the past three census reportings whereby the Hispanic Latino uh, population has continued to grow. And what makes this even more remarkable is if we note in the same census reporting periods, for Mississippi overall, the population has remained stagnant. However, looking towards the bottom, we see that throughout the same period, the Hispanic Latino growth has still been quite robust. Looking at the map of our region under observation, we note the different places from which our speakers were living at the time of data collection. So they were all uh, located in different regions. That's why we're kind of conceptualizing this as Northern Mississippi, some of them even up into the suburbs of Memphis. And what we wanna point out here is simply that not every region, even within that Northern Mississippi region is identical. So we have some places that experienced this rapid growth over uh, between the 2010 and 2020 census reportings, some that had smaller uh, growth trends. And again, just comparing a smaller community like Oxford, Mississippi with the suburbs of Memphis, we see that the numbers are quite different and the percentages are quite different. So again, even within that Northern Mississippi region, we see that there are important differences and our speakers represent those differences. Moving now to the other research site under investigation, we focus on Eastern North Carolina. Again, same trend as in Mississippi, we see that uh, exponential growth throughout the last three census reportings However, a difference here between the North Carolina and the Mississippi region lies in the fact that while for Mississippi, the 2020 census report uh, re um, uh, clocked 105,000 uh, Hispanic Latinos living in the region, where in North Carolina, we see there was over a million. And then again, North Carolina at 11% and Mississippi at 4%. So whereby both regions did experience this tremendous growth that Matt mentioned, we do see that re the regions do differ. And again, looking at the map, we again see that our speakers do represent diverse areas throughout the Eastern North Carolina region. And again, similar to what we pointed out for our Mississippi regions, not all regions are equal, nor in the uh, growth change from the 2010 to 2020 census, nor when we compare certain regions. So if we compare Tarboro, which Matt will later talk about with Raleigh, Tarboro is a small agricultural community, 6% Latino, but only at roughly 3000 Latinos um, in Tarboro. 
However, Raleigh is at 100,000. And in fact, if we compare the Mississippi overall Hispanic Latino population, which was at 100,000, we see that Raleigh alone has more Hispanic Latinos than the, than the entire state of Mississippi. So again, just pointing out that both of these regions under observation, or at least the states are not the same. Having established that the regions are both understudied, uh, fast growing Latinx regions with some notable differences. We hope that you'll agree that this is a fruitful uh, area of investigation that we're pursuing. Now, what we hope to do is highlight how generations, so we basically have two generations of speakers. Those are going to be first generation, those speakers who were born in a Spanish-speaking country in a Spanish-speaking household where Spanish was also spoken robustly in the community versus second generation speakers who were born in the USA and having parents who were born in uh, one of those Spanish-speaking countries. So we're going to compare those regions. We're also going to divide our speakers by generation, first generation and second generation. And we're going to show you two different results today one from a more formalized questionnaire in which participants self-reported their proficiency in Spanish and English. They gave us a good understanding of their histories, learning Spanish and English formally in the classroom, at home and in the community, as well as some other attitudinal and, ident and identity variables. And then after I introduce that and give you those results, Matt's going to follow that up with the, some results from our sociolinguistic interviews. And in that regard, we wanna show how certain linguistic practices such as code switching might also help reflect those changes, the differences in region, uh, and some of the uh, bilingual language profile scores that we're going to show you here. So our hypotheses are based on our own observations, the, the different census reports that we just showed you, as well as the previous literature. We do hypothesize that the first generation speakers, those who, were, who grew up and who were educated in a Spanish speaking community, have more robust experiences overall with Spanish, will in fact have greater Spanish scores on the bilingual language profile than the second generation speakers. However, as regards to region, we expect that the second generation speakers in North Carolina will show greater code switching, greater proficiency or dominance in Spanish, given that that North Carolina region does have a larger constituency of Latinos and as I said, as Matt pointed out, trying not to fall into the trap of equivalating uh, or, or equating Hispanic Latino with Spanish speaker, but to a rough degree, uh, th that's our initial assumption anyway at this point. So as I've mentioned already here, we're looking at the Northern Mississippi participant sample. We see we have our participants separated by generation. As well, we can see that in both generations, these speakers have lived in the South for over a decade. Highlighting the regions in, in the South, we just want to note for now, this is something we will certainly follow up on in our future investigations, but many of the speakers did in fact make their way through other Southern cities on their way to the Northern Mississippi region and the Eastern North Carolina region uh, in, in that context. And in terms of origin, the majority of our speakers, as well as in the second generation, the majority of the parents of those speakers did identify, uh, self-identify as, as being uh, Mexican or from Mexico. Now again, Eastern North Carolina, similar separation by generation, similar years in the US South. Again, different regions within the US South on their way to Eastern North Carolina. However, one notable difference here is that there is a larger diversity of Spanish speaking origin in the Eastern North Carolina sample. Now, it is important to note here that the data were collected at different time periods. So the Eastern North Carolina data was collected from 2014 to 2015. And uh, I'm sorry, the Eastern North Carolina data, yes, 2014 to 2015, the Northern Mississippi data, some years later from 2017 to 2020. All participants were consented and agreed to participate in the study. And thereafter, they conduct, they, they 
They filled out the bilingual language profile, which we will explain and show you so shortly. But again, this is just a self-report of their experiences with Spanish and English, their history with Spanish and English, their daily use with Spanish and English, and their attitudes towards Spanish and English speaking communities. And then again, the sociolinguistic interview, head mounted microphones, recorded, mostly conducted by students at East Carolina University and University of Mississippi, something we can talk about more after the presentation. And the important part is the sociolinguistic interviews. In those, we're also following up and asking participants about their sociodemographic backgrounds, their attitudes towards the languages, Latinx communities, et cetera. Now, the bilingual language profile, again, it's a self-report, multi-dimensional questionnaire that keeps in, keep takes into account many of the variables that we know are important for learning languages and using languages in our daily life. So the age that, that Spanish and English was acquired for each participant, their years of schooling in Spanish and English, the frequency of use throughout the week and with whom, with parents, with friends, with coworkers, et cetera. In the end, once you combine all four components, we're gonna show you the four components and then I'm gonna show you the results for those four components before handing it back over to Matt. But in the end, there, there is a cumulative dominant score, which can range from negative 200 to plus 200, but the closer you are to zero indicates more of a balanced bilingual, somebody who didn't show a strong tendency towards Spanish, uh, which in our case, I think is towards the negative 200s, and then a strong tendency towards English is towards the plus 200. So somewhere in the middle would mean both of the languages are kind of, uh, you know, balancing out to zero, really. Now, for this section of the bilingual language profile, the language history, each participant would have indic indicated, again, the age of acquisition of Spanish and English, their formal education in each language, and their exposure through family work and the community. In the language use section, they would report their weekly language use with family, friends, and at work for Spanish and for English. In the language proficiency section, each participant, this is their self-reported proficiency, also uh, worth reiterating here, but it is their self-reported language skills in speaking, comprehension, reading, and writing for Spanish and for English. And finally, in the language attitudes section, they're showing their identity, their affinity, uh, their perception of Spanish and English and Spanish and English uh, speaking communities. Now, I wanna show you the results again before Matt takes back over. And the results here, okay, again, separated by each of the four um, bilingual language profile section. So in this one, we're looking at language history where they again noted their years of formal education, um, their exposure at home, et cetera. And here we have it separated again by region and by generation. So to the leftmost part of the screen, we see we have Northern Mississippi, generation one, then moving right, Eastern North Carolina, generation one, Northern Mississippi, generation two, Eastern North Carolina, generation two. And for each of those groups, we have the Spanish, the, the mean scores for Spanish, and then the mean scores for English on the language history section of the bilingual language profile. Now note that the maximum score for each Spanish and English was 55. So these are not going to equal 100. Yes, we are comparing their scores for Spanish and English, but they're not meant to be combined to 100. So theoretically a participant could get the max score for Spanish and the max score for English. And what we note here, what we see here for the language history portion is that as predicted, first generation does show more language exposure, formal uh, Spanish education than English and in comparison to the second generation, whereby the second generation does also um, report having been regularly exposed to Spanish. So what we wanna point out here is it does it does seem to indicate that Spanish is being passed on, transmitted gener generationally in both of these regions. Now, when we look at the language use section, again, this is where the participants, 
participants indicated how often they use Spanish and English weekly. So it's more of an immediate th than the history, which was the long-term range over their lifetime. Now, what we see here is, again, generation, generation one does use Spanish more often than generation two in their daily lives. Generation two uses more English in their daily lives. One other thing that is worth noting here is when we look just at the generation two, we can see that Northern Mississippi uses Spanish less in their daily lives than Eastern North Carolina for generation two. So this is, while not a real robust finding yet, it does slightly tend towards that second hypothesis, which was that the North Carolina cohort was likely to use more Spanish in their daily lives because there's just a larger Spanish speaking community there. Now, moving on to language proficiency, again, this is where the participants self-reported their perceived abilities in reading, writing, speaking, listening for Spanish and for English. And what we see here is that here one takeaway might be, yes, these are bilinguals, right? Because in all cases, they're reporting that uh, they have reasonable proficiency, if not high proficiency in both languages. Yes. Generation two has a higher proficiency self-reported in English. Generation one has a higher reported proficiency in Spanish. However, another point that's interesting here is that the second generation speakers, while reporting higher English proficiency, their Spanish proficiency is still quite robust. And another small caveat, if you recall in the last slide with the daily or weekly use, it was North Carolina that reported more Spanish use. However, here it's Mississippi that indicates that their proficiency is still slightly higher than the North Carolina in the second generation. And finally, for the language attitudes, what we see, uh, I would, Matt and I agree, in, in a very positive note, remarkably, the second generation holds very positive attitudes towards Spanish, maintains very positive attitudes towards Spanish, even though, as we saw with the language use, they might not be using it that often in the community. As well, their English uh, attitudes are quite high in the second generation. So this might be good, a good indicator of bilingualism, biculturalism, et cetera, something that we need to follow up on. And just by way of conclusion, we note that Gross Gene terms this complementarity principle, stating that bilinguals usually acquire and use their languages for different purposes in different domains of life and with different people. And what we're going to do now is turn it over to Matt so that he's going to be able to supplement some of these bilingual language profile reports with actual linguistic utterances in the sociolinguistic interviews. Um, so, you know, what you just saw was kind of one way in which speakers did kind of, you know, directly speak to us um, about sort of how they're using language and what context. It's more of a quantitative measure that um, you know Stephen um, really kind of led the process of of that, and and, and also guided his students through what um, you know I'm going to share now, which is actually talking to them, right? Um, asking them sort of about their relationships with Spanish and English, how they make sense of that. That's kind of the wheelhouse of of my discipline, which is linguistic anthropology. And so rather than doing a deep deep dive into some of the different domains of Kind of linguistic form that we're analyzing for this project. We wanted to just give you kind of a sampling of the different phenomena that we, you know, sort of find meaningful and are going to expand on more in this work. By way of kind of illustrating too, just the usefulness of engaging with speakers in this more qualitative way, in addition to the quantitative measures that, that Stephen just shared. So um, you're going to get to hear some voices now. So let's start with this one. Sale, se está temblando todo. So era mi primer earthquake. So, eso estaba chido. Yo, mi hermano, y no sabemos lo que, lo que... So, it's just a brief quote, but, um, and actually we didn't transcribe quite all of it, but this is someone um, from our Mississippi group, um, a 21-year-old um, a man, um, sharing his experience of, of an earthquake for the first time. And the part that we didn't transcribe was there, and suddenly everything started shaking. Um, and so then he shares. So, that was, you know, his first earthquake, and that that was cool. Um, the way he says this is of 
keen interest to us um, for a couple of reasons. So that's so that you see um, in, in, in the yellow highlighting, that's what we call a discard course marker. It's a category of speech that if you start listening for it among the people around you, you'll not be able to stop and it'll become distracting you. Know, these are the ums, the so's, the likes. There's in Spanish, there's also a pretty, there's a very robust tipo, pues. Um, and so one of the things that's very notable about this is that this speaker has used an English language discourse marker twice to start sentences. Um, and so, you know, one indication of a fairly kind of robust bilingualism among the, in, within the speaker. And then the second thing that we wanted to point out is this speaker is from, his parents are from, he's second generation, his parents are from Nicaragua and El Salvador. But that, that adjective chido would not normally be heard in most parts of Central America. It's much more commonly associated with Mexico. Okay, and so what do we see in this speaker's kind of speech patterns? We see this kind of, um, again, robust hybridity, right? It's sort of the evidence of a lot of traffic and back and forth between linguistic codes and also social and cultural types of, you know, awarenesses and sensibilities. Um, and this is the kind of what some people would refer to as Spanglish, that really easily, easy shuttling back and forth that we tend to associate with larger population centers with more well-established Spanish-speaking populations. And sure enough, this, um, this speaker is from Los Angeles um, and spent a good part of his young life in Los Angeles. And so we're actually sharing this example with you first because he's kind of the exception that proves the rule um, for our Northern Mississippi group. We didn't see nearly as much of this, even among the second generation speakers in the Northern Mississippi group, we didn't see quite as much of this. What we saw was something different, um, which I'm gonna illustrate for you in this next quote. Básicamente, cuando estoy en mi casa es español, cuando estoy en un public setting es inglés. So this is, you know, Stephen mentioned code switches earlier. They're of great interest to sociolinguists and to linguistic anthropologists. Um, and this, you know, code switch is kind of what it sounds like, even if you're not in this field, right? It's, you know, a switch to a different linguistic code um, under certain circumstances and to achieve different ends in the course of speech, right? And so what we hear here is a 23-year-old woman in the Mississippi group um, she's first generation, um, was born in Mexico, but has lived in this area for, and I'm saying this because I feel like I'm there with you, even though I'm not, um, but has lived in this area, um, you know, for a significant part of her adult life um, and, and, and actually reports being fairly balanced bilingual, right? So an ability to really use these codes fluidly as she chooses, um, but she's using a code switch precisely to kind of convey the different domains of use in which she feels comfortable speaking Spanish and English, right? Um, so she almost like dramatizes or performs, right? A kind of stricter demarcation between Spanish and English. Um, not like that really intense hybridity and mixing that we were talking about with the previous speaker in Los Angeles, right? This is someone who's really sensing that in particular domains of her social life, really do call for different codes, right? Um, and so basically she's saying, you know, really Spanish has become the language of her home life, but whenever she's in a public setting, um, she's feeling the need based on kind of the attitudes that surround her socially to really kind of adapt more to the dominant code of, 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 her, of her social context. Um, and so, you know, that, that was, this is one kind of instance of code switching that we wanted to kind of share with you for sort of what it can, you know, the broader issues it can kind of call up um, in, in the social lives of speakers. Um, and here's another one. Um, this is a short clip. De mamá 24 horas al día. <laughs> Estoy estudiando para preparador de taxes. So this is kind of a different um, situation, but, but equally interesting. So this is a 30-year-old woman in the Mississippi group. Very similar profile if you... If you look at her in terms of age and time in Northern Mississippi, but note that that BLP dominance score um, actually would characterize her as much more Spanish dominant in her own characterization and responses, right? Um, so this is someone who is telling us basically 
um, that she doesn't shuttle back and forth quite as easily between English and Spanish. She try, you know, she's she's more Spanish dominant, um, and yet we have a code switch here. Um, and it's, you know, if we were to look at it in the ways that we will, and really look at how it sounds and what the timing and the call it prosody of it, um, it's it, it's a code switch that uses the sound system of Spanish much more than the previous one. But it's still we would call it a code switch. And, and there's, it's kind of indicative of a pattern similar to this kind of public setting comment from the previous speaker, where especially when people are talking about work, um, government bureaucracy, healthcare, um, these are the domains in which even speakers like this who are saying that they're more Spanish dominant are more likely to do code switches because in some cases, maybe they feel the need to do that in order to navigate the situations that we're in. So if you look, these are some of the other code switches that we saw even, you know, quite frequently among more Spanish dominant speakers, according to the BLP, internship, taxes, manager, part time, you know, sweet potato is not about the latest cuisine, or at least not directly as from a speaker who um, grew up in an agricultural area. Right. Um, and so we're seeing, again, that kind of the use of the way English comes into even Spanish dominant speakers um, vocabulary. Um, by way of those particular modes of social engagement outside the home. And then there's one that we're still working on. It's a real cultural mystery, uh, this code switch, but I know we're going to get to the bottom of it. Um, someone in the middle. <laughs> I've asked Stephen, I've looked high and high low as, as a North Carolinian by birth. Anyway, so there was a hottie toddy in there as well, which I think was actually achieving something different linguistically and socially, but you know felt only appropriate to acknowledge that. So let's continue moving on. We're gonna to shift to North Carolina now um, and, and to a very different kind of voice. Toda mi familia hablaba español y toda la sociedad donde yo vivía hablaban puro inglés. Entonces me crecí como americano hablando inglés. So, you know, a fairly kind of direct and robust statement about um, someone whose family was Spanish speaking uh, but who grew up in a really English dominant environment. Um, this is a second generation, 23 year old man from our North Carolina group uh, who rates himself as very English dominant, if you look at that overall score, uh, and who's basically sharing that um, he feels as though he grew up as, as an American, right? Speaking English, even though, you know, if you, if you listen to the interview, he has a high level of Spanish proficiency. Um, but remember that the BLP isn't only about proficiency, it's about this broader suite of factors. Um, and so, you know, this is this kind of maps to, um, you know, a process of change that we would expect to see, you know, from those um, second generation results um, in um, the BLPs. And I'm going to kind of come back to this speaker in a minute because of something that we see going on in the gen second generation, especially in North Carolina, not only about language use, but about racial and ethnic identification. And I'm going to let someone else from the North Carolina sample introduce that first, that, that observation. Variamos mucho y somos muy diferentes a todos los demás porque tenemos de todo incluido. Estamos mixteados de todo lo demás del mundo. So this is another young woman from the North Carolina group, second generation, um, born and raised in one of the largest cities in the state, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, which isn't insignificant. Um, this BLP score suggests very kind of balanced bilingualism on her part. And her response is to a question that was posed to her about what she sees as the differences between Latinx or, or, or Latino culture and U.S. culture, non-Latino, right? Um, and this is a very interesting kind of response that we tend to only see among second generation speakers who rate their kind of um, dominance as balanced or leaning toward English. Um, this idea of Latin cultures or Latin American cultures or Latinx cultures being a mix of lots of different sort of racial and ethnic identities, that's certainly true historically about the entire Latin American region, which has seen, you know, intense mixing of Euro descended, Afro descended and indigenous peoples, right? Um, the first generation speakers with whom we spoke tended to sort of just go with that kind of easy, like 
how is Latinx culture different from U.S. culture? Well, we care more about our families. We're a little bit more laid back, all of which are, you know, perfectly legitimate responses. But we see this shift among some second generation speakers to start kind of identifying with a broader sort of um, racial and ethnic landscape that really sounds a lot more like the U.S. landscape, right? And so we see that kind of exchange and traffic between some of these younger speakers or members of this community. And here's speaker, the the the, the other speaker from um, North Carolina. Cuenta de la gente de color se ha unido más desde el principio de el año pasado. Eso eso es cuando so just to kind of unpack this briefly again, this is this 23 year old man from North Carolina, second generation. And um, he's being asked about what he has seen as the changes in his community. Um, and he's talking about how people of color have become more united. Um, and what we really mainly, I mean, there's a lot to say about that comment and about how he unpacks it. But one of the really interesting things is um, he's including himself, right? And he's talking about being a kind of leader in a, a Latinx student organization and how he sees the common cause with leaders of Black and African-American student of groups and Asian groups. And so again, we see that I think much more in this second generation in particular among, um, you know, folks, speakers who kind of consider themselves more bilingual and bicultural, um, this shifting type of, of racial and ethnic identification, which means kind of a shifting definition of what it means to be Latino or Latinx in the U.S., um, so really interesting. Um, but there's a real caveat here, and I, I want to sort of now present a contrast also from our North Carolina group. En un país que la verdad no, no es tuyo, no es tu, tu país nativo, así que te vas a encontrar con personas que no hablan tu mismo idioma en cualquier lugar que vayas. Así que si es un poco difícil, es un poco difícil adaptar. So with some of those previous speakers, we start to hear this kind of opening, right? This kind of more intense exchange and traffic back and forth with other cultural and ethnic and racial groups in the U.S. We report folks reporting greater sort of our more balanced bilingualism. This is a speaker who has almost all of those same characteristics as the last two. She's about the same age. She's second generation. She's reporting fairly balanced bilingualism, a little bit of English dominance. But look how different her social experience has been. And the big difference there is that she's from a community called Tarboro, um, which is a primarily agricultural and much lower income area of the state by compared to Raleigh and Winston-Salem, which is where the other two speakers um, who, who spoke earlier were from. And so I think it's really important, again, to recognize that even within some of these fairly small regions, we really need to recognize um, the, the, the market difference of social experiences that, that some of these folks, you know, um, are, are sharing with us, right? I mean, it can really make a big difference. 40 to 50 miles can make a really big difference in your social experience and also in turn sort of how you're feeling about the language. And, and I want to share this quote, which is from also someone from a smaller and more rural part of Eastern North Carolina. Huh? Y a veces te miran como que eres menos que ellos y como si no sabes hablar inglés. Entonces uso el inglés mucho porque quiero que sepan yo sé inglés y sé, sé cómo comunicarme bien en el inglés. Sé cómo comunicarme mejor en inglés que en español. <laughs> sí. So here again, right, we're seeing very similar in age, second generation speaker, this BLP score marks the speaker as in fact English dominant. Um, but that sense of, again, kind of almost surveillance, right? That really kind of more rigid demarcation between when it is and isn't appropriate to use Spanish in the speaker's daily life and that sense that she's being looked down upon, right? Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge, right, if that's your experience, that is going to have implications in the by and by for how you speak Spanish, how you pass it along, what kind of Spanish you're speaking. And we're not being deterministic about that. But I think it's important to point out that those experiences are, over time, going to have some impact, right, on sort of the future of Spanish in this region and more broadly um, in, in the country. So I've only got one more, one more example, and I do just want to point to it as sort of a 
a kind of harbinger. Especialmente en un sistema donde se mueve a base del inglés y vos no entendés, porque siempre sos como el patito feo o siempre sos como el, como el extraño, ¿no? El único que no, como que no encaja. Aunque... Por el patito feo, I saw, I saw a laugh there. It's a, it's a kind of colorful, <laughs> the ugly duckling, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a colorful way of saying it. Not unlike, right, some of the other, um, some of the other speakers. This is also a speaker from North Carolina. Um, but I want to end here also on how he said what he said. This is a Salvadoran speaker, not a speaker of Mexican heritage. And um, this voz, voz no entendés, this is, um, this is the voceo. So Spanish has a Tuvu um, address system, and he's using uh, the voceo, which is much more commonly associated with the Spanish of Central America than it would be, or certain countries of Central America, than it would be with the Spanish of Mexico. Okay, so that vos no entendés and the sos, vos is the second person singular pronoun and sos is the way you conjugate the to be verb for that voceo. Um, and so, you know, what we want to, we want to conclude here to point out that, you know, when this interview was conducted, a change was, was kind of in the early process of occurring. And I mentioned this at the beginning of our talk where, um, Immigrants from the Northern Triangle were actually far outpacing uh, Mexicans in terms of arrival in the United States and immigration to the United States. Um, and that was a real shift demographically from you know, prior decades. Um, this is another kind of chart that shows that you see the sort of significant growth in folks from that region. And so, of course, they're going to change the makeup of some of these communities and their presence, especially in some of these smaller communities, is going to have more of an effect in a shorter amount of time if these are small places. And so there's some really interesting questions about, well, so this is you know, someone from Central America who's been in this region for a while who hasn't stopped using the voceo. Um, and so what does that mean in terms of the contact between different types of regional dialects of Spanish moving forward in these communities, right? And so that's something that we want to continue to kind of pay attention to. Um, I'm just going to basically conclude by saying, you know, Hopefully what these examples show is why it's worthwhile to really look at linguistic form and really listen in the ways we just have to speakers' voices because they're helping us to understand two processes of change at once, right? They're the kind of specific linguistic phenomena that come from um, languages coming into contact. There's the differing sort of, the shifting domains of use, right? Where speakers feel comfortable and at ease speaking different languages under certain conditions based on who they are. Uh, and then there's this big question of well, what does that all mean in terms of, um, you know, whether or not Spanish is then passed along to the third generation. We saw very positive attitudes about Spanish and its relationship to people's social and cultural identities. But we heard some of those same speakers saying, yeah, I want to pass it along, but I'm worried I won't be able to, right? Um, because of some of these factors that you heard some of our speakers at least expressing, right? Um, and then, of course, these all tie in kind of recursively, right? There's sort of a back and forth between language and these broader processes of social and, and cultural identification, right? The increasing sort of racialization of the Hispanic Latino identity that's been discussed by scholars. Um, and then, you know, another sort of factor to throw in there, the fact that, you know, we're now approaching a next generation of Hispanic Latino youth in, in this country who, who in many, many cases report that English is their dominant language. We saw that already among the second generation speakers. And so what does that mean about what it means to be Hispanic Latino and speak Spanish, right, in the future? And the use of all this, or the usefulness of looking at these questions in the ways we have, I would suggest is that all of this comes to bear in the moment of enunciation, right, in the utterance. Um, this is when individual speakers kind of negotiate and actualize their position vis-a-vis -vis all of these things. And of course, that's gonna shift, right, by context and over time, um, but that, that doesn't mean that we don't gain a lot by looking at language in the ways we're doing in, in this project. So sorry for going a few minutes over. We had so much good stuff to show you, uh, but we're gonna um, close now and I think open up for questions if anyone, if anyone has them. Excellent work. Thank you all. It's very interesting.
Thanks for the applause, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you too, Elsie. That's not I was wondering, I did have a question, if that's, if there's still time. Um, uh, thank you so much for that. That was really, um, it was really interesting to think about as someone who is a Latina here in Mississippi and not from Mississippi. Um, and so I guess I was wondering, just even the things that you all were learning um, and taking away, did it give you ideas for like further research um, or things that you're thinking about um, to kind of continue this work um, as well, because I, I was just thinking of lots of things coming out of that, but I was wondering if you all are thinking about ways to increase um, and continue research in other areas. I'll, I'll jump in quickly, but I'll also see, we'd love to hear your thoughts, you know, um, truly, um, either online or offline, um, because, you know, we're, we're two people and from two different kind of disciplinary perspectives, but, um, you know, these are such dynamic and shifting kind of questions that I think, you know, all, all suggestions are welcome. I mean, I, I think what I closed on in relation to sort of, you know, inter Latin American sort of dialectal exchange, right? Like how, how, for example, like a lot of the folks from Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala would say to us that, yeah, you know, and for, for understandable reasons, right? But they're like, yeah, the first thing I get is, oh, you're Mexican. Right. And, and so how people start to understand a, maybe a more sort of pan Latin American, you know, identity as the, the face of these communities kind of continues to change. I mean, first of all, if it does, but I, I think that's one of the many areas that I think is really worth. And then there are linguists, as I just tried to demonstrate, there are linguistic dimensions to that as well as sort of broader cultural ones. Oh, I know. Can I say something? Hi, I'm Selma. I'm a Delta State, you saw the Caribe, so Caribbeania. <laughs> e, like class A, I give class at Delta State and I could identify with everything that you said today. And I'm so firm, I sit in casa, escuchando exactamente lo que estás hablando ahora, porque los estudiantes, bueno, the, la, the, the heritage speakers, I have the same experience mm -hmm. with them here. And I am thrilled to be here today because actually I would like to do also studies um, in the Latino diaspora. Um, my master's was in um, Spanish language uh, from the University of Arkansas. We did um, the U.S. Latino. And I was actually thinking of the intra-Caribbean Latino diaspora. Mm. And um, we'll be talking yeah. later. But I'm happy to know that when you spoke about the social experiences, I've recognized that the hybridity of cultural experiences, actually, there's a lot of implications for the curriculum mm. in teaching mm. the heritage, culture, language, and also for ESL, which we're not talking about right now. But it's really, there's a lot of implications for the curriculum and how we view pedagogy, the way forward for these speakers. And um, I think it's very interesting, the scenario that we have with the demographics in the Mississippi um, area that you spoke about. But because I'm in the Mississippi Delta, I'm not only now getting into this area, so I've been going out to the Latinos and exactly what you said when you talk about um, taxis. I've recognized that when they talk about certain words that are ad identified closer with the domains yeah. in the foreign, in the English language that are closer, they automatically switch to these. I have another very interesting question that I'd like to ask you. Did you actually see that those from the, the rural areas, that when they were speaking, that the experiences were kind of similar? They were talking like, yo soy del, del otro, hablando del otro. Y hablando de que, que la experiencia que tiene como si era de otra cultura, se sentía un poco, tú sabes, ajena hasta cierto punto. Yeah, yeah. So I found that this was, this is quite interesting. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate listening to your experiences. We'll be, be able to have an, a copy of your video when you're done, your presentation. I think so. Yeah. Gracias, Silva. Gracias por los comentarios. I'm from the Caribbean. I'm from Dominica. Okay, bueno. Um, I, I, I think your point about, and this is one of the one of the kind of richest parts of the comparison that we've come across so far, right? How you do have these more metropolitan areas in North Carolina that, you know, based not surprisingly, based on the history of, of those communities, they're starting to look a little more like some of the larger population centers in terms of the hybridity and the mixing. But um, the, the 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 common thread between some speakers was indeed feeling a little more isolated in some of the smaller rural communities, right? And that sense of real demarcation between home and public settings that people are feeling. 
Definitely. I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in quickly and I'll just say kind of circling back to the education in North Carolina, there's already a few dual language immersion programs, um, whereas to my knowledge, Mississippi currently has zero. So I do agree. However, as Matt already pointed out, and as we spoke about in the talk, this Latinx demographic is overwhelmingly young. And so they're going to con continually be in our school system, at the university, et cetera. So I agree wholeheartedly that there's a lot of work, you know, there's endless work that could be done in that regard. Um, so yeah, I, I encourage you if that's something you're interested in uh, as well to, to pursue that or you know, reach out, like you're saying, to a local school there. Um, I'll note quickly that I in North Carolina, I tried this in Eastern North Carolina. We had a year long, um, initiative where we we wanted to gauge the interest of a rural community uh, at, at an elementary school of opening a dual language immersion. And by the end, um, I don't think they bought in entirely. What was interesting was the parents, I mean, everybody, most people, let's say administrators, students, it's parents that, you know, we had student rep, parents, student representatives, curriculum specialists for a year long, uh, you know, review of this possibility. And while most people were on board, there are a lot of important questions. Administrators were curious. If I don't speak Spanish, what's going to happen to my job? Administrators were curious how they were going to get the money to pay for the books and all these other things. And the parents were curious um, what's going to happen if my child struggles learning English. So I do want to say that while I always promote these initiatives, that experience showed me that you, you do have to have this community engaged approach first to really make sure that you have the buy-in because at that level, um, you're, I don't think you, any one individual will, will convince a school system or somebody else. Doesn't mean that we can't try. Maybe I was unsuccessful as one individual, but it, you know, it, I, I, that's what I learned from that. You really, we needed the community buy-in from the administrators, the teachers, and the parents. Um, so yeah, there's some great work on dual language immersion in North Carolina, in fact, uh, but in Mississippi, I think we're still in need. Yeah, we see we have the concept of translanguage in the classroom. You know, some some people do agree, some instructors agree, some don't, and um, it can be it can be a plus. But I think you have to be prepared to understand um, as to what um, what are the, the demarcation, how far do we allow it to go on? So that, as I said, lots of implications. And I do believe what you said this, we have to buy, have the community buy-in, that's the support behind whatever we want to do to have this concerted effort and this push to get it done. Thank you, great question. Afton, Katie, Stephen, If the to... two of you have time and if, if someone wants to stay on, we can maybe take one more question. Okay, yeah, I have time. So that, and I'm sure Matt does too. That's not a problem for us. We're trying to be respectful of everybody's. Thank you. Just if someone Friday afternoon. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we can do one more, please. Have you studied any of the physiological aspects of the way that the both physiological, physiologically the brain and physiologically the the throat and phonetics of of speaking between bilingualism and and just mono mono monolinguism because or just being a monoglot, monoglot, because that's something that I've been quite interested in because I'm interested in the neuroscience of speech and investigating that further. Yeah, Matt, Matt might, might also have thoughts on this. Again, it, it brings me to another study conducted in North Carolina where we did record bilingual children so we have six and seven year olds, again, from not, not directly from the households that Matt and I observed. That would be quite interesting. But these are also the bilingual children in the community. And we do have different measurements than what I showed you today, but we have their Spanish production and their English production. Matt and I, in our case, only have them speaking in Spanish. 
So from kind of a, a linguistic analysis perspective, it would be interesting. And we, we have attempted to do that with those children where we're trying to look at their phonetic properties, you know, how often they express a subject in Spanish versus English when they're in English mode and when they're in Spanish mode. And a student who, who really initiated that project as part of her master's thesis, um, she, she was studying speech pathology and we, they also did measurements for that to try and help um, set a standard for craniofacial measurements when bilingual children are producing sounds versus just English dominant in, in the profession of speech pathology. So I can't take much credit for that. I can only say that I was involved because I was interested in bilingualism in the community and I had this student in my class. So again, as we've kind of been saying throughout this talk um, and actually throughout the questions, which have been great, this can go in so many ways. I mean, Matt and I, Literally every, I think almost every time we spoke, we were, we, we didn't waste some of our conversations, but we spent some of our conversations about the tremendous data that we have in front of us saying like, man, you know, Matt wants to go talk to the radio broadcasters and, you know, check out the, the musical productions in these regions, you know, and follow up with more in-depth questions, you know, how come the, how come they didn't, follow up with, with the participant and ask them this, you know, he's like, why didn't they keep going with this? You know, so, so that I know how to continue moving forward when I collect more data. Uh, I know Matt's gonna ask me to, you know, push for more details, but we've spoken of a lot of different follow-up studies. This is just an area that needs a lot of research from all of these different perspectives. Right. Thank you. Well, that has been the beauty of South Talks, and especially those in the computer screen, virtual ones, is that we can stay connected, right? So I, I didn't ask Stephen or Matt. I'm sorry I didn't ask, but I thought you all would be open to it. Yes. To share their emails. Yep. Yep. So please feel free to continue the conversation with them. Um, Sarah Pinon is on our campus, Stephen. I asked her, do you know each other? <laughs> so I'm sure she will come into your email. Great, great. Dr. Rivera is also on, on, our, on our campus also. Um, and Selma, Miss Selma, hopefully we can connect also and stay connected. You're down the highway. So. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I will share this recording. Um, we have a graduate student who helps us with them. He does an excellent job. He's also a graduate student. So mm -hmm. it takes just a little bit. And then I will upload it. We'll get it on our YouTube and I will share it with all of you. I appreciate that because I'm actually doing um, some stuff, my doctoral program right now, and it will be somehow affiliated to um, the, the Latino diaspora in the Delta and um, <clears throat> curriculum issues and transitioning. So that's why I happen to buy it. I just happen to see this online. And I'm like, wonderful opportunity. Why don't I sign in? Yeah. And I'm from the Caribbean. You never know. But the input could be yeah. appreciated. Thank you so much. And maybe much. we can have you, I'm saying it publicly, have you yeah. give a South Talk yeah. and tell us about your research. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. When you're ready. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Stephen, very Thank much for you. your time. You for yes. Muchas gracias. Y bueno, buen yes. fin de semana para Thank todos. You. Igualmente. Que lo pase bien. Bueno, igual, igual. Muchas gracias. Gracias.